please welcome the remarkable Jason Moran to the show. Thank you for being here. A real pleasure and happy new year. Thank you. Yes, happy new year to you. So, um, you know, I one of the reasons why I wanted you to be my first guest, and there's a few sort of serendipitous reasons, but one of them was that you, I went to see you at the Village Vanguard for your annual residency uh, at the end of last year. And that was my first night out at any club, venue, anything to hear any music since February of 2020. Wow. Yeah. So thank you. It was, yeah. it was no, amazing. It was good to see you. <laughs> I think also, you know, I keep forgetting that there are always still these firsts that are happening. You know, like the, we have these markers, we talk about milestones, like like COVID is a marker, will be a marker uh, of a lot of our eras. And, and we'll have to tell people how we recovered. And music is one of those recovery systems we, we uh, you know, we need it. Big time. Yeah. Now, was that your first year back or did you do the residency in 2021 as well? You know, in 2021, we did perform live in 2020 we did uh the vanguard was doing um uh not live streams but but very basically live streams from the vanguard and that was very odd to play in the vanguard with no audience i gotta say it's it was kind of beautiful <laughs> um because that room is such a special place in our history in our cultural history uh, but, you know, it's nothing like a Vanguard audience, the intimacy of it uh, and the energy in that space when when we all get together. So, yeah, but that was the second time uh, in 2022. Got it. Did it feel like with each passing year, is it feeling a little more, uh, I hesitate to use the word normal, but for lack of a better word, is it starting to feel like that? I think, you know, I'll say one thing about the Vanguard. Nothing feels normal in the Vanguard. <laughs> and that's actually why I like playing in there is, is because I respect the room too much. You know, um, I know that it's a space that people put a lot of ideas in that small stage onto that small stage that changed the sound of the world. And so when I walk in there, it is always on some, you know, you better, better bring it. <laughs> um, and so it never quite feels normal after all of these years of performing at the Vanguard. There's something special that I try to treat that room with, um, a lot of care and a lot of delicacy, but also with a lot of sweat, you know? Um, mm -hmm. The normal part will always change for us as artists, uh, hopefully, like we don't get stuck into like what a routine is. And I think I chose this music because it does not rely on routine. It relies on some kind of ingenuity that 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 evolves in the moment. Wow, yeah, that's so true. Speaking of when, so this is we're here to talk about your first live album, The Bandwagon, which was recorded at the Village Vanguard uh, twenty years ago, um, and it, in August, I believe, of this year, it will make the exact twentieth anniversary. Uh -huh. <laughs> So let me ask you that. Let me let me stop and ask you that. Does do these numbers? Does time resonate? Does, does it mean something to you now that you can say twentieth anniversary for this or twenty fifth? What does that mean to you now? Yeah, I th you know numbers do matter, and and especially the ones related to time. Um, I need you know some kind of reflection point, but it only is worth. Well, I shouldn't say that, but meaning. Like, it's nice to re reflect on something that you had joy in making. <laughs> yes. Say that. And and that was a special time, I, I'd say, in my life, too. Um, that very night that we were recording that record, I just proposed to my wife, Alicia Hall Moran. Um, my parents were in the audience, you know, like it was like a year later, my mom would be gone, right? Like, there was just a lot that was right there. Uh, there, there was New York also after September 11th, so it was also in its, you know, kind of coming back moment, you know, much like it is right now with COVID. Um, so there was a lot in the room um, of the feeling, and it was a nice place to start from with Taurus Mateen on the bass and Nasheed Waits on the drums and all of the things we brought in on the mini disc uh, player, uh, the other, my, my grandparents speaking on General Shift South, Ahu Garal from Turk, from Istanbul, speaking on straight out of Istanbul. 
And so there was just, you know, there was like, it was kind of like a gathering. It was a, it was a real document of a gathering that went beyond the great audiences that, that come to the Vanguard. But it was also marking the beginning of what I didn't know then would become kind of a ceremony that I would try to perform every year at the, at the Vanguard during the week of Thanksgiving. And it, you know, it was a beautiful moment. Yeah. Yeah. Cause now it's like, it's a part of, it's embedded in New York holiday tradition or ritual <laughs> truly you know for those of us who love this music it's like yeah. we know you know and then the, there's this almost iconic I would say you know photo of you and Taurus and Nasheed in front of the bandwagon I think did John Rogers take that photo John Rogers did yes yes, yes. I mean that that photo is just it's it's quintessential New York at this point you know mm -hmm. you know you know just speaking of those two brothers, it, it also marks in a way for us anyway, the the establishment of what I think is one of the most important groups of, of my generation, which is the bandwagon, which is mm -hmm. your bassist Taurus Mateen and uh, Nasheed Waits, which I know you had worked together on Black Stars uh, before that, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, right, on, right. On the band. Yeah. But we started when... working together kind of off. <laughs> we, was, we started working together in protest <laughs> to other bands who couldn't stand us as a rhythm section. <laughs> I want to say that. <laughs> okay, that say more. <laughs> say more about this. <laughs> I, the, the, you know, I, I, I don't need to say too much, but let me okay. say it like this. Okay. Um, Taurus and Nasheed and I met kind of in different points. You know, like I met Nasheed when I was still in college and we were playing gigs with singers like Clarissa Sincino, who went to school with us at Manhattan, with me at Manhattan School of Music. And sometimes she would hire Nasheed. And I was like, oh, wow, damn, Nasheed. You know, he was touring with Antonio Hart. You know, he's the son of Freddie Waits. You know, he has, Nasheed has all this kind of like New York swag, right? Um, Taurus is like our big brother, Nasheed. Now he's the big brother in the band. And Taurus was like, you know, he had already been on the road with Terrence. He had been on the road with Betty Carter. You know, like Taurus was that guy. And he was also like playing with the Goody Mob and all the outcast folks down in Atlanta and playing with the Roots. So Taurus just knew how to move around, a real nomad through music. And uh, we joined together as a rhythm section in this group called New Directions that Blue Note Records put together at the end of the 90s. With myself and Mark Shim, Greg Osby and Stefan Harris. And, you know, most of us were new signees to Blue Note. And during this 20 city tour of America uh, that was sponsored by Camel Cigarettes. <laughs> yeah, <it was> bizarre <laughs> this moment. is the 90s. <laughs> this is the late 90s is bizarre times. Um, but during that 20 city tour, Nasheed Taras and I, we started to find something together. And on Facing Left, which was my second record for Blue Note, was when we kind of like started to put some of our ideas on, onto, uh, onto uh, recordings. But the bandwagon record at the Vanguard was like, this is how it hits people, you know, mm. like, and it was something about like moving away this space of like being in the studio and showing what it does, what the music does to an audience real time. And it's what I've always loved about listening to records of John Coltrane, you know, playing at the half note, you know, or Thelonious Monk at the five spot like the way an audience sounds around a band, the way the audience sounds around Shirley Horn, you know, like there's something special about these live records, the, the way Donny Hathaway's audience sounds when he plays What's Going On. You know, I love that the lady's like, what's going on? Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> All right She heard now. it. She was like, wait yeah, a minute, yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so like, right, so there's just something about that documenting the audience as part of, of what this music is that, uh, that, that also is as important as the studio record. Is it also sort of like a rite of passage in a way? Like, do you feel like, you've got to do at least one live album, you know? I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that. I, you know, cause now we've done two records live at the Vanguard. And I think for us, it feels good to, especially to record it there, you know, like it kind of like it's our home field to a degree. Yes. Um, and th so there's something that we want to capture about that spirit that lives in that room. You know, I think also, you know, when you make a live record, it is also about the place you're playing in too. So there's some regard that is inherent to saying, I want to record here because I know the audience feels this way. I know how the room feels, you know, and let's play together. You know, uh, Keith Jarrett at Carnegie Hall or something. We know, you know, like kind of what that feels when it when it's coming out of the piano. So, I, you know, 
I wouldn't say as a rite of passage, but a lot of the great, you know, you make me think like, damn, where are all the hip hop live records? You know, <laughs> like, Truly. You, know, you know, like thinking about like how it felt to be listening to the roots in the nineties when they were coming to New York, like what it felt like to be in those clubs, listening to that band or when the far side came, like, I remember how that felt in that room. Um, mm -hmm. But I think for, for jazz music, because it is about a certain intimacy, um, then it's fun to kind of record that as a project too. Mm -hmm. When did you know that Taurus and Nasheed were your people? Like, did you know instantly like, okay, this is a thing. This is. I think I'd say that the way Taurus and Nasheed play, I had no fucking idea what they were doing. <laughs> right and I loved it <laughs> right. meaning like I couldn't say like was it good or bad in the moment that it was happening I couldn't tell because I couldn't decipher it and I couldn't process all of it and I'd say during that first tour we found some of the language right and then we I think we started having discussions and I had and privately I always told them I never really kind of told the public but we had like two bands or maybe three, but two bands definitely that we were like, these are the emblems that we're going to go for. And one band was a band that Max Roach had with the piano player Hassan. And they made one record called the, Has the Max Roach Trio featuring Hassan. I said, that's, we're going for that, that kind of energy and power. And then the other one is John Coltrane's group. <laughs> the group with, with McCoy and Elvin and Jimmy Garrison. It was like, how do we play with that kind of energy, but we don't have a saxophone that's wailing? Mm -hmm. you know? So what is it about? Like, can we? And so then you got to find repertoire that echoes that move, you know? And so for us, the repertoire just started to go widely rather than kind of keeping it in a, would have been traditionally given to, I'd say, you know, to audiences as like a the repertoire that happens in the Vanguard. I thought, man, fuck that. You know, like there's yeah. great songs out here. Like, you know, we should be playing the songs that we like. You know, and, I, and that's what I felt like my favorite musicians had done. So we wanted to more honor that tradition of, of pushing. But I had no idea what they were doing. And, but then we would start to find a language together. And then I knew that that couldn't be replicated by any other group. And I said, mm -hmm. right, this is worth keeping, you know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Speaking of you saying, you know, you guys decided to go bigger and not smaller. I feel like just with that intro, mm. with the, the bandwagon loop, it's yes. like, okay. <laughs> like, y'all yeah, set the signal real early. Yeah, like, yeah. This, this ain't about to be, you know, yeah, T, T right. for two. You're right. You're right. I kind of forget <laughs> about that moment that, you know, I used to use the mini disc as a very important, like, fourth member of the band was the mini disc. And I'd have all these kind of loops and tracks, kind of pre-recorded collages, and they would kind of dot and throughout the set. And so that opening sound is just like the the MC Cormega <laughs> saying bandwagon. <laughs> and I, yes, and, you know, I like it shows knew. up. Yeah, it's Cormega. <laughs> Shout out I, Cormega. I always wanted to know who that was. Word, oh, that's Cormega. crazy. Anyway, that's uh, you know, like that's just um, oh, you, you know what. You make me think about how a lot of the, like that element of the way the, that record sounds and the way samples are used, and maybe the best uh, the um, example is growing up listening to De La Soul and listening to how Prince Paul kind of made these skits and you know kind of like pasted together parts of history on top of one another, with a lot of you know musical integrity at the same time. Um, so Prince Paul and, and the three MCs, you know, um, from De La Soul, they nailed a kind of quirky humor, but you could not deny how good they sounded, right? Like, yes, like a little bit off, but totally in the center. Um, and they definitely had a huge impact on my listening. And so the bandwagon record, that's kind of where you hear, you know, most people heard it live uh, when we were performing because I didn't record all of that the way we worked it. But you hear in that intro, like the, the, there's something else kind of moving through this band and it's not always coming from the instruments. Absolutely. And and let's let's stay there for a while. I was going to go somewhere else with this conversation, but let's go somewhere else because you brought up uh, sampling, the mini disc and De La Soul. So I, w I, 
I, I want to ask you, because this album, to me, is as much jazz as it is classical, as it is folk, as it is hip hop. It's really this amalgamation of so many things, right? Mm -hmm. But coming from Houston, Texas, what, because I, it's hard for me, like, being from the South Bronx, you know, coming into the world at the dawn of hip hop, like, of course, Bless hip hop you. is everywhere. It's like, it's in my veins. Exactly. Yeah. But for you growing up in, and I can almost fathom it on the West. I can fa like all the way West. I can fathom it, you know, in the South, my thoughts and feelings about these other, mm -hmm. you know, uh, interpretations of hip hop aside, I have a clear understanding of maybe how hip hop could come into the consciousness of people in those regions. Mm -hmm. Texas, mm -hmm. talk to me about um, how you access, particularly mm -hmm. New York hip hop, mm -hmm. uh, you know, growing up. Yeah, you know, fortunately I had an older brother who's three years older than me, uh, Yuri. And Yuri listened, I mean, he listened to a, a wide, variety of music. He was also kind of a rebel. So he was also listening to a lot of punk music that my parents didn't listen to. So my parents would listen to all the soul and jazz stuff. And, but then for us, it was hip hop. So I remember clearly him coming home and being like, oh, yo, there's this song out by this group called Public Enemy. You know, hopefully they'll play it on the radio tonight. <laughs> At the top <laughs> on the top eight at eight there you go you know? <laughs> you know and then i remember being in the kitchen with my brothers waiting for the number one song on top eight at eight and it was public enemies my uzi weighs a ton and oh it was just so the music was getting to us now i don't know how long after it had left new york but it was reaching us and also because the music uh especially def jam was promoting it in such a way with such high visibility, like people like LL, like there would be these tours and they would come to Houston. So I saw, you know, LL run DMC and, you know, Public Enemy on a on a huge Def Jam tour. Later, Big Daddy Kane with De La Soul and all these other bands would come through and on a, you know, together. So you had these moments where you could catch them, you know, yeah. like these big festivals. Um, but it'll be one night in the big uh, arena where the Houston Rockets played, this place called The Summit. So, you know, so it was getting to us and also but more importantly was a group called the ghetto boys and the ghetto boys were from fifth ward and they you know bushwick bill willie d and scarface they were like oh somebody from houston made it you know that was huge right like and people still talk about scarface to this day like what oh. a, you know incredible mc and a real inspiration for a lot of us. And then also an incredible blues guitarist too. <laughs> incredible. Um, what? So there was, yeah, so there was what? something happening with like watching them do it too. And that gave, I know, a sense for not, and I know all the other musicians from Houston who've all kind of like gone out here to do that thing. Watching somebody from your crib make it yeah. is major, you know? And it gives, a, and, it, and whether everyone acknowledges it or not, it does give people a push. So Bum B and UGK, like all the crew that comes after, like is off of the wave that starts with, with the ghetto boys. And like in jazz, we we had people who left and, and moved to New York, you know, Frank Lacey, Billy Harper. We have people like Joe Sample, like people who are from the crib who Ronnie Laws, the whole Laws family, like incredible people. DJ but, Premier. Yeah. Oh, well, and then then there's Premier is his own segment of life. <laughs> Facts. <laughs> he is his own universe of greatness, thank God. And so mm -hmm. we also knew that we could leave. And but we also had to figure out how to do that. And 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 enough of us started leaving at the same time that we were able to form a community. But but it was it was reaching us. It was just reaching us slow. But also we had to find where was our footing with what we were hearing. And I think now we kind of have a good sense of like, oh, when we look back, actually, we were re we were getting ready to start to tell our stories. Yeah, yeah. And talk to me a little bit about what that was like for you in terms of were people ready for it? Because, you know, now, for the most part, I think people don't give it a second thought. It's just mm. a, a thing. Mm. But in 2003, 
you yeah. know, and, and in the early 2000s where, you know, you or, you know, even maybe a little earlier with Osby or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Branford, mm -hmm. I mean, right. it was still uh, not totally accepted. And there were these very strong opinions, I'll say, yeah. about it. Um, yeah. What made you feel like, fuck it, um, this is this is what I do and or this is what I'm doing now. Yeah. And, you know, especially as a new artist where one might think perhaps, you know, you may think, well, let me play it safe for now and then I'll slowly branch out mm -hmm. versus, you know <laughs> what I mean? Like that's it. There's a lot of that. I was just telling Alicia this morning, you know, about what it felt like to have my teachers, Andrew Hill and Muhal Richard Abrams, both tell me, you better do what you want first because they're gonna if somebody tells you oh if you do this and then you can do this a little bit right later, they were like don't believe it you know and and I wow. led with that charge early on and I'd say Branford Marsalis also a person who linked up with Premier you know uh Branford is is incredible example of someone who I admire and I actually that you bring him up I had a dream that I called him on the phone to thank him <laughs> for this very thing Wow! <laughs> last night. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> so that you brought that up. Wow. Um, or that you bring them up. But yeah. there's, um, I I do remember this in making uh, that record, the, the, the visit we made to the Vanguard a little bit earlier in the year was only for two nights. And I brought my mini disc and the sound engineer asked, you know, did Lorraine Gordon hear you play this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> it was the first moment that I thought like, oh, is this, is this the right place to do this? Like, <laughs> and I just thought, you know, yeah, like this is not wild. What John Coltrane was doing was wild. <laughs> right. <laughs> Me playing a mini disc is not wild. The boy, get it through <laughs> your head, you know, she's heard way more than that. Mm -hmm. So I felt like, nah, it's worth trying. And also audiences are different, you know, the, um, and I didn't necessarily, you know, I don't, I can't listen to the public opinion a, uh, a lot because it'll, it can be distracting. Um, so I just thought that I had seen the effect of this around the world when we were on tour. Mm -hmm. So I knew that it had a place and it jarred the audience in a way. So if they came to see me play, they should never expect to just hear the instruments that are on the stage. They mm. might also keep an ear out for the ghost <laughs> and it might show up in the mini disc or you know the sound might come from somewhere else and it was just to awaken my audience that the sound could be anywhere and it might not be coming from myself Taurus and that sheet all the time yeah and so with some of those samples that we'll get into some of those loops that we'll talk about as we hopefully hit as many of these tracks as possible mm -hmm. um were you doing um, like, what were you using to sample at that time? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, it wasn't the sampler. <laughs> okay. I am a long time Logic lover, you know. I uh, started okay. working with Logic, you know, very long time ago. And it seems to be the program that, you know, that I've just kind of grown with over the years, still use it to this day. And it always is saving my life. Um, so I was using Logic. You know, the thing about the mini disc for me was when I first had the mini disc, and a lot of other musicians and people had mini discs. And we would record and bootleg gigs. So you'd record rehearsals on it. It was so small and, you know, quick and easy to edit. Um, but also I thought like, well, I use this as a way to document the world around me. So if I was in the way I recorded the woman Ahu in Istanbul was I had my mini disc. And then at the end of the day, I just held the mic. I was like, tell me about what we did today, you know? And because it was a way for me to like, remind myself of where I was. That's how I was using it. Much like the voice memo on your phone today. You know, right. You press the voice. So MD was was quick and easy like that. Um, but I was using Logic. Logic was a way to kind of like, kind of crudely make little mixes and, and see if they, you know, export them back to the MD and, and play them on the stage. And also design wise, the mini disc is inconspicuous. Right. You can't really see it on this. It's like a small little, you know, four by four inches. It's yeah. Tiny. So, you know, you're not looking at a big machine. You know, I'm not doing this on a drum pad <laughs> or nothing. You know, I'm just like pressing play on a little bitty thing. Mm -hmm. um, and and where would it, you keep it? Like on the top I of the piano? I kept it right on the top of the piano, right in front of me. And, mm -hmm. um, and then I just kind of memorized where the tracks were and then just press play. 
And the MD also had a beautiful feature, one of my fa favorite features on any kind of thing. It's like the oven turning itself off when you when you set the timer. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Is that it would play one track and just stop, right? So it didn't wouldn't just go into the next track and go into the next right. track. Right. Just play one track and then it would stop. So it almost was like if I was trying to envision it, if an audience heard that, it was like, wait, something appeared out of nowhere and then it just stopped on its own like or, wow yeah, like you know what i mean like it, it wasn't yeah. like they didn't see me like stop it, it right was, it was just it did it on its own I, I, I love machines not as much as herbie does but <laughs> but i love the capability of machines um and how humans decide to use them yeah yeah i i think it's fascinating the way you incorporated it into um your work you know particularly particularly on this album because like you said it's live and they're watching you you know uh so but I never knew that it could do that so so you could be just going in right and they never see your oh wow yeah it's like a magic yeah. trick yeah and 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 it was you know for years I had fun with it and then at some point I felt like you know what I should can I play piano? <laughs> I just thought I, I thought like you know, Jason, you should just probably just go back to just straight piano, right? And there's something else that I, maybe I've learned from using these voices in this way, and that's what we started trying to figure out as a band after that. After I kind of stopped using the mini disc, but also maybe the more important thing that what about the MD was like what I, who I was recording. So the track "Gentle Shift South" has my three grandparents on it all naming in kind of a list uh, all the ancestors they could recall off the top of their head, you know, and and then just putting them in a row. And I also knew that because I'm in New York or wherever else I'm traveling, mm -hmm. people don't really hear Southern accents like that. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and and um, all my grandparents passed away now. And so I tell my cousins and my aunts and uncles frequently, like, you know, like, but, you know, I know we all hear hear them in our head, but, you know, like I really tried to make a way to put our family tree in a piece of music that would live kind of forever uh, in the public uh, to trace ourselves with. Um, so, you know, I'm glad I did it then uh, just as a as an exercise of, of remembrance for them. Yeah, Let, let's talk about that because Gentle Shifts South um, is sort of uh, like sort of smack dab in the middle of the album. Mm -hmm. It's this gorgeous uh, ballad, I guess you could call it. And uh, you had recorded it previously on Modernistic mm -hmm. as a solo piano piece. And then uh, for, on, the van on the Bandwagon album, as you just stated, you it's layered with all of these beautiful um, voices of your family members. So I wondered if you could tell me uh, the names of, ex of exactly who we're hearing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, you're hearing my grandfather, Andrew Moran, uh, my grandmother, his wife, Claudia Moran, who we call Mama Clay, and my mother's mother, uh, Benny Ruth Chester. Yeah. And, mm. it, and there's one moment where you hear my mother chime in because she was with me on all these interviews that I did. Um, you hear my mom say, Pete. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, that's your mom. That's my mom. Oh, <laughs> yeah. wow. Yeah. So she, so she got in there. Uh, yeah. And yeah. So so those are the three people. Um, I mean, I recorded them like the conversations are long, but I just kind of clipped out when they named the people. And yes, they even know, spell the names. Yeah, of, yeah, Z A R A D A. You know, like Zareda. Um, yes, yeah, you know. I think when we're learning music, like in conservatories, and the way "quote unquote" jazz education rolls, is it almost tries to delete you, and um, it always has you focus outward, which is okay. That's studying. That's that's what you do, but because the music relies so much on your unique perspective and and the greatness of the music definitely relies on it also that perspective meeting a kind of technique then we got to figure that out how so how was i going to be playing all these choruses or songs and not be talking about my family that seems mm. crazy mm -hmm. you know thelonious monk wrote songs for his family you know 
Like, how would I write a song for my family? And that, you know, Gentle Shift South gets to that, that question about, I've seen artists do it. I've seen poets do it. I've seen playwrights do it, you know. I've heard some musicians do it, right? But how would I do it? And it's the moment where you kind of got to, like, even get, as dancers, when dancers are rehearsing, they rehearse in front of a mirror, right? They rehearse with the company in front of a mirror. And then at some point, they cover the mirror up. Mm -hmm. You just got to, now you got to just do it. You can't see everybody around. You make sure your unison is together. You kind of just got to go out and do it and perform it. And I think making a kind of a self-portrait like General Shift South was, you know, that was a, it was a big step for me, I'll say, mm -hmm. just uh, because it was the kind of thing that I felt, I felt I wasn't hearing it from my generation. Let me say that. And, um, and I knew we weren't all cold hearted. <laughs> right. Right. Despite you know, whatever the ghetto boys were saying. <laughs> You know, like I, I knew that there was a lot of heart in what musicians were trying to do. And maybe we all didn't have the language to try to figure that out yet and or the techniques. And I thought, well, just planning my family's voice right into the song is not even abstract anymore. It's just these are people, you know, and that maybe if somebody's listening to this, they're hearing their own, you know, ancestry in their own head about the people they know, you know. As Let a me, song plan, so absolutely. I mean, that last piece you just said is is the reason why this 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 whole thing is very special to me. I just lost my grandmother three weeks mm, ago. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Sorry thank you that. so much, and um, and thanks for your flexibility too around that. I appreciate it. Um, you know, when I was ten, I have a cassette tape. I'm the only person in the family who has this because. Mm. I think you and I have a similar uh, passion for our roots and ancestors and culture. And so I had uh, recorded Daddy James and Nana, and I'm just asking them questions, you know, and, um, you know, what did your mother like to sing? Or what do you sing? And making her sing. And she's like, I don't know how I'm going to sound on tape. I'm like, come on, Nana, do it, you know. And I have this. Yeah, and um, yeah. I think that even when you were describing, you know, the Vanguard that night, you know, making the proposal, your mom in the audience, like all of those things. One thing I've noticed about you pretty much from the time that I uh, became familiar with you and admire so greatly about you even now is how, I think as musicians, there are certain things that you could argue are inextricably tied to the art and then it becomes individual, like you said, like, well, what's personal to me? Mm -hmm. And I think that I've always felt that whether it's um, an artist in residence album where you're, you're simulating your mom taking notes, you know, and the scratches on the pad, like um, all of these ways that you've been intentional about um, representing your roots and your family and your culture and your ancestors. And like you said, for your generation, even, and I, and I want to ask you about this, even your, your mentorships, mm -hmm. whether it's Jackie Bayard or um, Andrew Hill or, or, you know, whoever, or even your, your collaborative projects with maybe a Charles Lloyd, mm -hmm. um, where it seems like you just, it's important to you to not present as if this happens in a vacuum. Yeah. Where does that come from for you? Well, I mean, I think the biggest lie told to black folk over and over again is that they're doing something for the first time. And, mm. oh, we have a first black president. Okay, hold on. You know there's a president of your block, right? <laughs> you know there's a mayor in your neighborhood, you know? Yes, sir. And, like, so how do we acknowledge, like, all of the effort of the people who were didn't get that big newspaper article, you know? didn't get the millions of votes, you know, but who you had great regard for and have probably more to do with your life <laughs> than the president does. So, wow. So in, in music, it's the same, you know, I, I think most of us who got into this know that we weren't going to be doing it for a zillion dollars, nor the fame that you were doing it for something else that was calling you. Uh, and 
and as Charles Lloyd likes to say, he got bit by the snake and he, and he, and he, and he liked what he felt, you know? Mm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And, and so we kind of stay in it. And for me, I think when I, I think part of my yearning was when I left Houston, I knew I was missing that. That meant I was leaving my family. I you know, was very aware that I was going to be the brother who would move away and I probably would see my family a few times, you know, mm -hmm. a year. Uh, so how could I churn them up in the places where I was, you know, and that that and I felt that the musicians that I loved were able to do that, too. Um, and whether I knew, I knew their entire biography, I felt that they were being soulful with themselves. And, you know, I think a question I started asking was like, how do we collect ourselves? You know, how do we give the 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 good and the bad things that happen to us value? Um, you know, the mentorships that I had kind of saved me because they continue to say, like, you know, it won't come easy. You will be ridiculed. Um, you you should be looking for a different goal than your friends are looking for. Um, and you should find some love if you can, you know. Um and you know, like, so all that happens at, at the same time. And I didn't ever want to feel like my big thing is when I get to the gates, wherever the gates are, mm -hmm. I get to the gates, you know, is Jackie Byer going to be thrilled that I kept saying his name and playing his music? You know, I want to give him no reason to slap the shit out of me. <laughs> you know what? That particular I, welcome home. I don't. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I want to give, I want to give him a, I want to give him a hard dap, you know, like yes. well, I was playing the shit out of your song. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. You know? Like I want that. That's what I don't want in my afterlife. That's what I'm really, I really am thinking about that a lot Um, because this stuff is not eternal. So yeah. I think when, I, when we're young, we think it is like, ah, I'm just out here, you know? Um, But, but I also, I think over time I knew that if it was going to be anything worth reflecting, then it would have to have something potent in it that would stand the test of time and have people want to go back to and listen to, not like an old record, like, ah, you know, that don't even sound good anymore, but put the things on it that I love the most. And uh, so the, this record, I, you know, I kind of didn't think about it that much until you were like, yeah, let's talk about this record. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> um, but, it, but, I, but at that time, it really was where we were as a group. And, you know, and we were we were unafraid of anything, you know, um, because we had had some hardcore teachers around us who drilled into us, like, you know, they gave us harsh criticism uh, mm. in a good way. Andrew mm -hmm. Hill, you come see the band. He called me the early the next morning, tell me everything that was messed up about it. <laughs> I was thankful. That's, that's yeah. why I have him as a teacher. <laughs> yeah, I, abs I would imagine so. Yeah. And so let's, speaking of Andrew Hill, I want to talk about, gangsterism mm. i want to talk about it as a as a, as a concept as a as a a a, a theme yeah. there's it's it's uh so is is it based on and it's based on sort of an andrew hill composition right mm -hmm. called erato e-r-a-t-o incredible song yeah uh yeah. and i was actually i was in houston one time maybe one holiday visiting my parents and I, I could hear part of the song in my head, but I couldn't hear the rest. So like, so I just started making up this other thing, you know? Oh, that's yeah. how it, and, okay. and then it became gangsterism on canvas. And then I played it for Andrew and I was like, Andrew, uh, I have this song. It's, it's kind of like your song. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, it's okay. You know, he was like, it's okay. And so then I thought, okay, you know what? I'll treat it as a composition exercise. I'll keep trying to find ways to manipulate the song as I felt the way Duke Ellington had done, you know, felt the way Charlie Parker had done. They take little bits or the way Jerry Allen improvises, she'll like manipulate the phrase over and over again. So I was going to try to do that with a composition. So the gangsterism became the theme because I thought it was very, you know, unofficial and gangster like to just take somebody's song and be like, I wrote this. <laughs> um, so that it's a nod and also an apology to Andrew Hill at the same time. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Believe I, me, it was an awkward moment when I had, when I played it for him, was like, I, uh, you know, and he was like, that's cool. <laughs> right. Right. So the, it's cool was like, 
you have my blessing is cool. Yeah, you have Got my it. blessing. It was cool. Like yeah. almost like the nerve of you. <laughs> yeah, right. So that because that's what I was going to ask you. What is gangsterism? And you just explained it. it it's, yeah, it's partially it is that. And it's also the, you know, uh, when I was I used to live with Stefan Harris across the hall where I live right now. Uh, uh -huh. But on my door, I had this poster of a painting by Jean-Michel Basquiat called mm -hmm. Hollywood Africans. Mm. And it's a gorgeous painting, um, but on the, of the many words he has, but on, one of the words he has scrawled on it is gangsterism. So I, you know, every time I went in my room was gangsterism, 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 gangsterism. Yes. And so that's the word comes from Hollywood Africans by Basquiat. Uh, but the, the feeling comes from hearing a song and feeling like you could take it too. Uh, and, but you know, that's my teacher. So I try to, you know, honor it as a composition exercise in, in because he's such a great composer so i want to keep working with it you know I, I think that's absolutely brilliant my mind is blown i because i i've wanted to know this for so long and the answer is so good <laughs> like the, the explanation is so fucking good wow and and also it sort of uh you know gets to the heart of the visual art that you are so inspired by and you being a visual artist yourself and you know and the whole Basquiat piece I, I had no clue so I want to run through a few of them because we have mm -hmm. gangsterism on canvas right that's the first one yeah then we got gangsterism on wood yeah gangsterism mm -hmm. on a river gangsterism yep, on a lunch table yep Gangsterism mm -hmm. on irons. That's right yeah gangsterism on stages which is the one that's from the album we're talking about yeah. Gangsterism on the rise, on the set, mm -hmm. over ten years in the wind. Did I cover them all? That's it. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. And time every for a new one. I need to make a new one now. You do. You do. <laughs> I. I mean, I love. I love. Love. Love each iteration of it. And first of all, it's just gorgeous, right? Like just the the, the harmonically is so beautiful. But then, as you said, just it's almost like you are a painter mm -hmm. with with these. Uh, with these motifs because each one you know they I don't know how to explain it because I don't I don't have the language of of art you know I, mm. you know but um yeah. Hmm. yeah I hadn't I guess now that there's so many I think I think of it kind of like an easter egg too you know like mm. if you knew that you know, there was an earlier one you're like oh shit let me go back and listen I mean you got to really be into some shit to to kind of do that comparison study um but it is like looking at a figure though, you know, it is like a, when we look at how painters sketch uh, the, the body, cause like mm -hmm. the, you know, from the, the early cave paintings to, you know, whoever's taking a photograph today, how do we like, like make that outer line, that outline of the body? How do we shade the body? You know, how do we, some people have multiple heads or ears or, you know, like the perspective is multiple. Um, and I think in, in one of the things I was thinking of when you named the early part, like on canvas is about is about the medium that you work with. Mm -hmm. So like painting on a canvas or a, or a woodworker is on wood, gangsterism on wood, gangsterism on a river is for Sam Rivers, but like as if it's for the water. Um, yeah. And gangsterism on irons is for the the danger that a golfer uh, <laughs> is from my, actually my younger brother, Ty. It's like gangsterism on the irons is about the iron that... Um, that golfers use when they're playing on a par three that goes over the water. <laughs> so, oh, wow. Like, so the gangsters on the stage is like for the Vanguard, you know, it was like one we just made right then. And, um, and for, and it was a big transition for the gangsterism series because it went straight to the blues mm -hmm. as the source, you know? So now it still has that, that feeling of a feel holler. Now we're treating it like it's a feel holler. Mm -hmm. I, uh, that's brilliant. I love it so much. Um, so I, I want to ask you about uh, the piece that comes after uh, Taurus's tune, which is, you know, you guys have the audience on fire for like nine minutes with 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 another one, uh, a great tune. And then there's this gorgeous reprieve with the, the Brahms piece, the intermezzo opus, uh, number 118. Is it, how do I say that? How, how do you actually break that classical thing down? I don't know. What does it say? Intermezzo number it says, 118, opus number six. Is that what it says? Uh, or, I think it's opus 118, number oh, two. 
Yeah, okay, there you go. That's it. <laughs> That's how you say it? Okay. <laughs> it's so intimidating. I'm like, wait, so it's Intermezzo Opus 118, number two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's written it, by yeah. written by Brahms. Brahms. And yeah. So yeah, Brahms, you know, Brahms, like I remember being in school and Manhattan School of Music, and you have to take Western music history. <laughs> mm. Right. And which meant classical music, uh European classical music. And and I remember like class was cool, but I would hear these songs and then we wouldn't really get a chance to like hear them. So I was like, you know what? Once I got out of school, I started listening. Like, let me listen to it for my enjoyment now. Oh, let me try to play it. And 118 is a pretty famous piece of his. Well, because you you hear it, and I'm playing it kind of badly, but you hear how gorgeous that me that melody is. And Brahms has a way, I'm making this up, but Brahms has a way of making the 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 piano feel like, like he loved it from another era before they had pianos, you know? Ooh, so by the mm -hmm. time he meets the piano, he's like, this is what I've been thinking about for you. This melody goes like this, and now it moves down here, right? And then it grows from here, and it moves here, and then, you know, and then we get to this moment where we make this loop in the middle of it, because as of, as of, you know, a few bars of music, Brahms kind of has some of the best best loops that have not been looped yet <laughs> so um, i want to ask you specifically about that because you play it pretty straight down mm -hmm. up until that moment yeah where it's just the sweet spot it's just yeah. the it's yeah. the oh it's so yeah. gorgeous yeah 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 and it, then you do a sim oh yeah mm -hmm. go ahead no go ahead no you do a similar thing with um with body and soul That's where bad. you extract these moments almost offering them to your audience or your listener as an entity in and of itself, mm -hmm. where we really get to meditate on just this thing. And mm -hmm. it, it feels like sampling. It feels mm -hmm. like something is, that yeah. someone would do out of yeah. your era, right? Yeah. Of, of hip hop and stuff. But I would love for you to talk to me about, because that's kind of one of your hallmarks where you can extract these gorgeous yeah. moments that might pass somebody else by. And then what happens is, because it's such a fleeting, gorgeous thing, you give us the gratification of getting to like bathe in it. You know what I'm saying? Because, <laughs> yeah. because you're going to let us like listen to it for like five minutes or whatever, yeah. this one sweet moment. So I'd love for you to talk to me about your approach and, you know, anything you, you want to say about that. I think you nailed it when you said meditate um, on it. Um because you know repetition is like mantra it is like chanting um when you hear a thing over and over again it, it doesn't it's not that thing it becomes a new tapestry uh much broader um so that repetition of that phrase you know um it's like yeah you you nail it because it is also kind of a luxuriating in it you know like damn did you hear that <laughs> it's like it is like definitely the past is in wait i don't think y'all heard me now yeah <laughs> <laughs> wow yeah you know, like I, I think it is like very much you know that like wait rewind that rewind that play, wait play that again you know like it is it is that and then but letting that evolve too so then what does this moment where we decide to oh actually let's just place the repeat bracket around this moment now what does that want to create too and um and i think in our in our music that's essential uh it has been for centuries uh so you can you can find that everywhere all throughout west africa all in the north africa all in the south africa all in the east africa you hear that you hear it in japan you hear it in india you know the, the need for the repetition mm -hmm. um, so so brahms you know you know like gets that treatment um and i also wanted to like that's how I think of class, you know, like that kind of music. As I think of it as, nah, this is, it's fruit, you know. Like, and every once in a while, you like, whoa, 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 whoa. Let me, let me play this a bit more, um, and let me show an audience who might not play it this way. This is how I think about it, you know. That was, I feel like, a thing I learned from Thelonious Monk, is he was always going to play the song the way he thought about it, and so this is the way I think of of Brahms. Did you feel any? intimidation because you know with 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 classical i'm gonna assume no but mm. with classical music being this very buttoned up like oh it's this very you know serious for whatever 
you know, whatever that's supposed to mean. But um, did you feel that you might get backlash for for trifling with? <laughs> oh, well, nah. look, I, I like the song too much. And I think yeah. even the person, even even the, the a musician who might not like the way it played won't deny like, oh, well, he loves that shit, though. <laughs> yes. You know? Yeah. Like, and, and, and at a certain point, like I was saying earlier, I, I can't really tune into where the uh, where the uh, the opinion might come from. You know, there's like this this thing where like, you know, like um sometimes when you're looking not necessarily for the the good word but you're looking for the bad word you know like so i'm mm-hmm. looking for the the critic who is like gonna say that this is sacrilege you know like eh. right don't i like the piece of music right can can it live there um and how do i share that and so i mostly wanted to start from that place this mm-hmm. is a place of honesty and also on my very first record i played ravel you know, and you know, like so for me, it it lives also in my first step into into the world is to take a Ravel piece and totally make a new loop out of out of uh, Le Tombeau de Couperin. So, like for me, it's mm-hmm. like, nah, this is where I've been going from jump. Uh, so, look, either you do or you don't. But I mm-hmm. love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, I, same uh, here. And I I think it was sort of, you know, it shouldn't be bold and revolutionary but it it kind of you know is this is also a music that you studied early on you know as a young person it's a music that there's still uh, a lot of you know gatekeeping around you know black folks playing it and and things like that also like even like like that always sometimes that happens when people decide to stop paying attention to all the all the evidence out here like do we or do we not love the way Duke Ellington plays Tchaikovsky (laughs) <laughs> like you know what I mean like right. don't he put some swing on that Tchaikovsky that was not there before he did that right like <laughs> no actually if we consider him Ellington like as one of our all right like you know he showed us how to respect everything that's right, right? he showed us oh. how to imbue love in, into the church into the alley you know you know into the above into the ground like into Harlem like he showed us how to do that so these are lessons. They're not necessarily lessons that only apply to him. Uh, I felt like, no, nah, the evidence is out here that this is also how we touch. I mean, it's what it's what every great musician that I that I that I love is what I felt like they've been able to do. That Donny Hathaway, the way he plays "What's Going On" by mm-hmm. Marvin Gaye, mm-hmm. it's the same thing. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, or Superwoman, right? Yeah. Or, or, yeah. yeah. You it know? is the same thing. Wow, I never. <laughs> so he did it with a contemporary. I don't know Brahms, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Um, I, I want to ask you. Um, I hope I'm not keeping you too long, but I, I want to ask you about. Um, uh, we we kind of brushed on it, but uh, straight out of Istanbul. Mm, yeah, um, that was big. That was so big. yeah, like first of all, you know, we see people like you know Mono Neon. Yeah. Uh, you know, sort of uh, yeah. pitch matching, just yeah. speaking voice, and you know, with Cardi yeah. B or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. But like, you were twenty years ahead of that. You know <laughs> what I mean? So I, you know, and I love, I love Mono. No, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's no disrespect. Yeah. Uh, I think he's amazing, and I think you're amazing. So, um, tell me about like, first of all, the ear you have to have to do that because you do it with Planet Rock as well. That's true. That's which true. is amazing you know, you some stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I mean by technique. You know, like when I talk about technique, I think people think of technique is like, how does this work? Mm-hmm. And how the technique is, it lives here. The technique is like, what tools do you use and what tools do you d- decide to refine to get your practice across? Uh, and everybody ain't got the same technique, you know? Right. So, but the person who inspired me to make it uh, straight out of Istanbul is um, Hermeto Pasquale from... and. <laughs> such a brilliant composer, uh, multi-instrumentalist in Brazil. And Hermeto Albino with this flowing white hair. This is guy mm-hmm. incredible. And he, you know, I heard a record, Festa dos Duesos. Uh, and on that record, he transcribes Pig. He transcribes a teacher in a, like, a, like a grade school. You know, he transcribes a football match being, you know, like he transcribes a politician. And he does it at the synthesizer, right? Like, and mm-hmm. he makes these kind of grooves sometimes, and it's bizarre. But he, for me, 
is the goat of this. He's the one that I heard like, because he pulled it into uh... our language. And I felt like the thing that I wanted to add to was like, okay, so now what if the bandwagon started to improvise on this? Because mm -hmm. I hadn't quite heard that part happen with it. Um, and that's what I thought, well, this will be my addition to the innovation is like, so we can improvise on this too. And you can take it, you know. Um, but I'd say the, the great part about logic was that, you know, I could go section by section and kind of like transcribe the whole thing. But then learning it took you know years you know like i'd have to walk around and listen to it on the train trying to hear the nuance and then come back to the piano and try to play the phrases but by virtue of that it totally changed the way i played because then it got me into understanding what a laugh sounds like on the piano you know right um, and so in this conversation so i asked ahu uh she's now flautist living and singer living here in new york I asked her, she had taken me around Istanbul, me and the rest of the band, who I think was with Greg Osby at the time, mm -hmm. like took took us around around Istanbul to the Blue Mosque, right? Topkapi Palace, you know, like all these places. Then at the end of the day, I said, oh, so tell me about what we did today. And then she starts talking, right? Uh, and then her cell phone rings and, and it's her mother calling like, you know, where you at, you know? Uh -huh. So she just starts talking to her mother, you know? Um, and and I love that there was this like, so you're hearing half of a conversation. Right. <laughs> so it becomes like a very, you know, like full of these little short spaces, kind of like a monk melody, you know. Mm -hmm. Um but that but that was kind of, you know, like a thing that for me was, you know, such a joy to do and to make part of the practice was the piano is very much a machine, you know, and so it can't quite bend notes like a guitar or a saxophone can. Uh it can't like circular breathe. So it'll be a challenge to try to figure out how to play these melodies or, or these voices. Mm -hmm. And you said it took you years yeah. to get that together. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you could talk to Taurus and Nasheed about what it felt like to rehearse this shit. I mean, it was like, <laughs> arduous. We were like, oh, God. you know, we'd have to go phrase by phrase. And, and eventually we got it. And then right. we just performed it on the road all the time. Mm -hmm. We didn't care whether or not people got it because we just needed to practice it. Right. And over time, then it felt like, oh, we just knew it. And we couldn't wait to go back to Istanbul <laughs> to perform this song. Yeah, did you? About, yeah, we did. And people were like, yo. <laughs> they didn't say it like that. They just right, they, right, said right. It <laughs> <laughs> they said, thank you for honoring the language, the Turkish language, you know, as a as a romantic language, as a, as a language full of melody. Thank, you know, like, thank you for honoring honoring our language. And I thought, oh, you know. You know, the how do you, you know, the other part is like a lot of the music that we make and the people you speak with on your uh, podcast make, you know, it goes around the world. So it has impact in other geographies. And But then like, okay, so then what do you also give back to that geography too? Oh. And I felt like this was a kind of, you know, like a, a thank you to the great city of Istanbul that goes through a lot and that inhabits so much history. It's really, a, you know, it's a it's a, a pivot point in in the landscape um so I, you know to 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 make a song about the sound of that insanely beautiful and complex city uh you know felt good to do wow you, that, that's a, that's such a brilliant point i never thought about that because we tend to think that we are bringing our music and culture to you know, this is our gift to you, and yeah. to to a, to, and to an extent that is true. But I, yep. I have to admit, I'd, I'd never thought about it the way that you're saying it, where there's that reciprocating. It's essential. It's essential. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, that's when we talk about the, well, I, maybe people talk about diplomacy and music. You know, um, there's other factors that are at play, um, and we're in a real, really, we continue to be in a strange time um globally and especially in the country this country so where does the music kind of like live as part of the dialogue process mm -hmm. people? Um, mm -hmm. and we'll and we have to continue to make sure that we have it in there somewhere somehow uh to show and i think the music we make has the opportunity to do that because it doesn't it doesn't necessarily place a boundary you know so that's why i say ellington doing tchaikovsky that's, you know, like, that's like, he's giving it up, you know, like, right. You know, like, you know, you impacted my hands, you know, it's a, it's a gesture. Uh, and we all could stand to do some more gestures. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you, you mentioned um, the practice piece, you know, uh, 
because of, of something so complex that it took a lot of, you know, practicing it out. Um, but in general, do you guys practice still? Do you still rehearse? A little bit. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we, we just rehearse a little, you know, and mostly if I'm working on some new music, but most rehearsals end up being right before a gig. Mm. And, you know, because now we have a language, you know, there's not so, there are different kind of rungs we need to climb on a song together. Yeah. So like, you know, even the most recent work with James Reese Europe, now we've been playing that music for five years, four years. So we kind of know it, even though the public might be hearing it for the first time, we've been in it for, for a little while. And that's kind of how we, we bake songs. Um, I think in the early years, we used to practice a little bit more because I felt like I had material that we probably should focus on if we were going to mm -hmm. present it uh, for the first time in front of an audience. And I might be scared that we ain't even really know the song, mm -hmm. and yet we were playing it for people. Yeah. But then the other side was like, sometimes that's the best place to be, you know, mm -hmm. Maybe the magic also lives there. So Taurus and Nasheed, they, you know, they're a very special uh, bass drum rhythm team. They are like real brothers and they both went to Morehouse. They, you know, they both are from musician families. You know, their family is really in music. Um, so they have a way of looking at the music that also helps calm me down. And let go of mm -hmm. any kind of like, oh, it's got to be this way. They really, they really cured me of that long, long ago. Yeah. It's going to be the way it's going to be. Wow. So if you could give like an archetype to each of you, right? Mm -hmm. It could be superheroes. It could be a fruit, a vegetable, a plant or whatever. Like what, what would you, what archetype would each of you be? Ah, that's my goodness. <laughs> um, okay so first of all i'm tony morrison <laughs> <laughs> love it yes let's say that that's, okay. that's my archetype okay that's my aspirational archetype here for uh, it I'm, I'm i love say it. that for real um but Thomas is, you know he has a sense of him where he loves family so much uh but he's also like He's also like the sage in the band, um, mm. with a deep religious Islamic practice. Uh, and so we go with him when he, when we're in Islamic countries to, to be with him when he prays, you know? Mm -hmm. So he's our sage, you know, he is the sage of the band. Um, Nasheed, New York City, you know, like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like, he's got, like, such a sharp, a sharp uh, edge on him. But, you know, like, there was a, there's, like, a way that he plays. I wouldn't call it, there's a character in early Mortal Kombat, this mm -hmm. guy named Raiden. And Raiden wore all white, and he has a, a hat like a field straw hat mm -hmm. goes around him and he can make his body electric like that uh -huh. and then he can also disappear into the ground <laughs> and then come up on the other side of the screen he can uh -huh. do that too that's not she that's okay he plays he'd be like <laughs> you know like, be like yo what the hell just happened <laughs> to the song <laughs> And there's something that, ah, oh, you know, is great to play with because it it never quite ends up where you think it's going to be. Um, but yes. It electrifying. So he's raiding. He's yeah. raiding. I love that. <laughs> I love that. And you're Tony. I'm Tony. <laughs> All day. I love day. it. Oh, my God. So Aspirational yeah. Tony. Let me say that. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Not deep like that. I wish I was. Man, <laughs> you, you're, on, you're on your way. Did you ever meet her? Did you ever get to meet her? Yes, I did. You know, mm -hmm. Alicia and I met her. Um, there was She won an award from uh, Penn, um, and they were honoring her for a lifetime of work. And Alicia and I were asked to make music for the evening. Wow. And, and this was at the new school. And so... Uh, Delroy Lindo read passages from her books, and then we would play. And then, you know, Ada Perro, what was her name? Uh, she read excerpts, and then we'd play. And then at the end, Tony came on stage. She said, and this was like a few years before she died. She, mm. she read, she said, I would like to read the opening paragraph from my new novel. And she read the opening sentence, which I will never forget to this day. Mm. The opening sentence, as she loves to slay in that first paragraph, the mm -hmm. opening sentence was, 
I put the cup on the ledge to catch the blood. Oof. Oof. That's where it started. So, you know, um, when you hear the beginning of the bandwagon record, it was like the bandwagon. Yes. <laughs> the bandwagon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's my version of I put the cup on the window Ooh. seat to catch the blood. <laughs> it's like it's starting right now. Um, but yeah, she, we did meet her and she was she was so kind and uh and and, and she, yeah, one of a true true treasure. Absolutely. And fellow Aquarius. Fellow Aquarian, yes. Which yes. I have to mention to you, right? So I said, you know, I'm into astrology and stuff like that. So yeah. when I saw that the podcast was launching during a Mercury retrograde, I yeah. said, uh-oh, because, you know, you're not supposed to do mercurial things. And I'm like, yeah. you know, even now I'm like making sure it's still recording because, you right. know, things can glitch and, and fuck up. <laughs> and, then, and then on December 29th, I was just like washing dishes or something random. And it hit me like a bolt of lightning. I was like, this is a good omen. Yeah. Why? No. Because of your song Retrograde. <laughs> right. <laughs> I was like, of course you're talking to like this brilliant Aquarius, like born the day before your son. That's great. That's right. <laughs> who wrote the song called Retrograde. And you did. Yeah. So I was like, this is actually like a wink nod from the universe. This is so nah, cool. It's all good. Yeah. It's you know, all the, good. Yeah. There's a, I use my, now I use my, uh, my, horoscope to more be like you know like you know like you know okay be aware All be right. aware i can do that you exactly know? And, and, I, and, I, and i and i do read it sometimes more seriously than others you know mm -hmm. um but also conversation is is really necessary so you know i hope i hope it's a good omen <laughs> oh oh this i mean this conversation is 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 everything let's close with talking about um your 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 latest project i know that you've been in james reese europe universe oh yeah <laughs> you know for for quite some time and um i think you even visited his his resting site and and things like that yeah, yeah. um so yeah I, I would love for you to um just talk to me a little bit about the project um, how it came about and a little bit about your your process and and who you are now having learned so much about this very important person james reese europe um important composer and organizer at the beginning of the 20th century coming to new york city from dc um as a composer and he started the cleft club which was kind of a musicians union black musicians union he's storming into carnegie hall with 125 musicians in 1910 and 11. He's kind of like making all the hip dance songs of the time. His his sheet music is sold everywhere. He's he's a sensation in all regards. He's the Quincy Jones of that time. Wow. And but then he wants to go fight in the war in World War One. And black folk thinking about what they owed the country is complex. It continues to be, especially in the armed forces. But he and a bunch of others was like, "Nah, I want to. I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna be the example." Uh, and, but then when they figure out that he's gonna join the war, he wants to lead a band. They ask him to lead a band and they pay him to lead a band. And he does, and that band does a lot for kind of setting up the scale that becomes big bands 10 years later. He does that early on. And um, and I heard about him through Randy Weston, uh, the great God, Randy Weston, who sat me down in his home and gave me the lecture on James Reese Europe. And it was like, you gotta know who he is, Jason. And he's saying it to me like that. And Randy Weston at six foot four or six foot five. When yeah. he tells you, you need to know something, you need to know something. <laughs> the period, point blank, period. <laughs> and so over these years, I've been developing this project uh, that started in London with an organization that was honoring uh, the centennial of uh, uh, the end of World War I. And that's when it started. And uh, it's called 1418 Now. And I couldn't stop thinking about the music. And I couldn't stop thinking about that gaping hole at the beginning of our origin story for our black music. It's one that kind of like was missing. And I thought as much as I love Thelonious Monk, people know who that is. As much right. as I love Fats Waller, people know who Fats Waller is. Right. No, I'll need to kind of double down and say this person's name. Even if nobody ever listens to the record, they should hear the name because I just wasn't hearing the name. And so just say the name, James Reese Europe over and over again. And now it's kind of at a point where 
I got to tell you, there's a lot of energy around him and it's, and it's rightful, uh, much like Terry Lynn Carrington, making sure sister's names get out here. You know, um, it's the same for James Reese Europe and like, how do we kind of like, as contemporary musicians know that there's something wrong about how the history is presented to us. And then what do we do to say, look, let me, let me fill that gap for you. Here's, here's the text. You know, That's right. And I think Randy was, was, uh, I, I, it's not lost on me that he's had that specific conversation with you. Mm. And I, I think that, um, you know, I want to say thank you to you because, you know, when the elders speak, you listen. Yeah. And that's, that's something that we could stand to do a lot more of, you know, because it's, I think sometimes we think, you know, oh, well, how are we going to move forward if we're always having to, but we are moving forward by mm -hmm. listening to the elders and sort of taking their instruction to heart. And mm -hmm. I, I know that he, you know, would be so proud of you. And he is. I, I hope so. He is. He, he's someone at the gate too. He's going to be looking at me. Oh, come here, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> I remember this one time I went to see Randy at Jazz at Lincoln Center at Dizzy's and I went mm -hmm. backstage to say hello. And he comes out and he's going like, He's holding his breath. Uh-huh. And he goes, oh, and he lets out this plume of smoke. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's right. Let it get in there. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But now Randy was, he was an important figure because he didn't, he never stopped saying Africa. He never stopped saying it, right? He was like, no, nah, this. Right. He's like, no, nah, I'm going to plant it in you. Like when you come see me, this is what I'm talking about. This is where it comes from, you know. This is you like my song, you know. It comes from these rhythms, you know. That's right. He was like, "No, nah, you have to keep telling people, and you have to be unafraid to do it." And um, so I'm thankful for his time and uh, uh, and for his wife Fatou's time to to sit down that day with me. And they continue to over the years too. They were always so warm uh, mm -hmm. with a lot of the younger generation uh, because I think yes. he understood his role in the community. And he was always the Baba for that, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you are, you know, a Baba in training. Oh, my sure, gosh. Sure. <laughs> you know I'm what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you got not not just because you got the, you know, the grades coming in to prove it, but certainly for your tremendous work and impact and dedication to what's beyond the surface. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you so, so much. Um, where can people find you and all that good stuff? Um, I am on Instagram, the Jason Moran, and I only sell my music on Bandcamp. So uh, you can go to a website called Bandcamp and uh, go to Jason Moran. And all my music is there. All my new music that I own. Come on now. <laughs> yes Records, right? Is it Yes? Yes, yes. Records, yeah. Yes, yeah. indeed. I, I, I'm kind of keeping it very... Uh, over there uh, as a as a platform for now uh, but yes that's where you can find me awesome thank you jason my we pleasure will thank see... you angelica and we'll see you next time oh this was wonderful this was just